Hi, Dalin. Thank you so much for joining me today. I love to start all my interviews by going to the very beginning. In the mid 90s, you received a 3 a.m. call from a girl who said, I'm outside your gate. My house is number 13, Porsche 56. What's the story behind that? So, back then in the day, which I knew you read my Quora. So, yeah, yes. you should have told me that. Lydia, <laughs> no okay, way. I should have asked more questions, right? Okay, fine. Day. Okay, right. So, I like that. Fine, I mean, smart. Sorry for the global audiences. When you were young at the time, you realized, I think I had my first mobile phone, which is an Ericsson, by the way, before Nokia's. When I was 14, I was dating a girl. So we wanted a phone in the room. I managed to finagle my mom to get me a phone in the room. So it was the whole cordless phone. So I was like, okay, I'm going to put the phone down. And we would buzz each other. But back then, you know, most people didn't have your own phone. So you had to go down and call. You know, you had one phone for everybody in the family. I was the only one lucky enough to have that. Right? But it was a phone that was connected. It was just cordless. So at 3 a.m., I got a call. And I'm like, okay, I thought it was her. But she wouldn't be calling me at 3 a.m. Because her parents would be curious, right? picks up the phone and it was this random girl amazing voice by the way I'm like wow okay 3M wow not that I was cheating on you by the way right because I had hey this is amazing sounding woman or a girl on the phone so my house in section 14 in PJ if some of you may know section 14 has a very famous middle school which is 3M I was right up the hill so the house is about maybe 40 meters up the hill so I was thinking hmm, maybe it's a girl from 3M I know it didn't hit my mind that it was 3M because I thought hey a girl's calling me I'm a guy in a guy's school man any girl calling me I'm going to be leaping out and then she says, hey, my house is number 16. I'm outside the gate. Oh, it's cold. Can you open the gate for me? And I'm like, it was weird. Who are you? And then she's like, I'm your neighbor and I can't go into my house. Can you open the gate for me? Right? I'm like, okay. Not everybody has mobile phones, by the way. So I don't know how she made the call. I assume it was a mobile phone. I said, no. Which house are you in? She said, number 13, 14 stroke 56, which is the road. And I'm 16, so I assume that the thing could be opposite because that's how it works in Malaysia, right? And I said, okay, but then goosebumps started coming up. I'm like, hey, okay, this is odd. Hey, you know what? Why don't you try and call your parents? So my parents aren't around. I'm like, your parents aren't around? You know, they're not around. Okay, you know what? Let me try and go down and open the gate. Lila, right? What am I going to think? Panicking there, right? Lied. Put the phone down. Tried to go to sleep. The phone kept ringing. So I unplugged the power cable and I went to sleep. Okay, so I still thought nothing of it. I still thought maybe there's a cute chick living across my house. Score. So I asked my mom the next morning, hey, who's number 13? Is there a family living there? Because I'm not familiar because we just moved in a couple of years before. He says, I don't know what's number 13. So as we got out of the house, I looked at the house in front. It was 14A or 12A, right? Because nobody liked number 13 in Malaysia. And the house is devoid of anybody. I think it's been abandoned for at least a couple of weeks, if not more. And I'm like, okay, that was my first moment that I got hit on by a ghost. Or my friend was pranking me. If you are, please tell me. It's been 30 years now. What if you called me that night? So thanks for starting with that, Lydia. No worries. I feel a very interesting story. <laughs> Another story I picked up from Cora, which I love because it's from your dad. And I thought it was reflective, perhaps, of what your family is like. Your dad said, I feel you got a lot of experience on media. What are the real successes you've actually achieved to get so many interviews in the press? <laughs> I'm so curious to know what you said. My dad is the funniest man alive, but he makes some of the best sarcastic comments. So that's one, but I will also start with this. We've done businesses a lot together, right? So every time you show him a projection, or at least when I show him a projection, he says, okay, so you know you've got profits and then you've got you know, your cost and then you know whatever your projections. He says the only thing, and after many years of looking at all these projections, the only thing that's going to be accurate is your spending line. So here's the business magnet you mentioned too. <laughs> So yeah, he's not the hardest man. I, I love him because of the fact that she obviously he's my dad, but she's not the kind of person that would just be difficult. He coaches in a sense. He tells you what it is and how it should be. And he's very much old school. We were talking about baby boomer generation. He's very much firmly in that baby boomer generation. And to him, it's like, how are you raising more money if you're not making money? I mean, to that generation, every dollar you make, if you keep 20 cents as profit, that's what you used to spend on business. So was he the person who inspired to do business itself? Yeah, I guess in some ways, everybody wants to have someone that they look up to is one, but for me, I'm a competitive person, want to beat, right? <laughs> That's something that you, I guess is a North Star. Say, hey, look, I want to beat this person. Someone, it could be a brother, it could be a sister, it could be a mom, it could be your dad. And at least someone that you can say, look, at the very least, if I beat that person, I've achieved my first master. The person you wanted to beat was your dad. There wasn't anyone else. Yeah, I think so, yeah. That's a psychological question that I never even realized. Oh, wow, I save money on my psychiatrist. Yeah, cool. Yeah, but you end up doing economic. Was that something that your dad said? You must take a step at least be educated before you start a business. Okay, so this is the unique thing. Again, yeah. there's nuggets of wisdom. I wanted to go to the best university in Australia. 
And at that time I was majoring in law, but siding in the business side. And my law lecturer told me, he says, look, if you want to practice law, are you sure you're going to be able to sleep at night if you're representing someone that is guilty? That never crossed my mind because I was only thinking about doing corporate law, right? He says, well, you know, it's something that you've got to think about. You could have someone who's doing something wrong on the corporate side, but you're defending it. And I'm like, okay, that's a question I never asked myself, right? Because at that time, you're watching all these cool law firms, right? Ali McBeal. So then I said, okay, I'm not going to do that as much as I love it. Then I decided to do more in business. And then when I go to Melbourne, I met the guys from the University of Melbourne. They said, look, why don't you do political science and economics? Because I think that will be more unique rather than just doing engineering business. I said, okay, interesting. I like politics. I had a lot of friends who were in politics back then, still do now. And I thought, okay, but politics alone, what if I don't want to be a politician? But my point is, I think economics was the semblance of sanity that I could justify to say, I have a degree that potentially could get me a job. Because I didn't want to be an analyst at that point in time. I don't think it was a very active environment back then. Because if you remember, Rewind 20 years ago, it was a single party system. I mean, there were other parties, but it was dominated by one. Okay, I don't mind joining that, but I want to allow myself the opportunity to be able to be malleable, which I guess is fortunate now because I'm not a politician. Not yet. <laughs> never say never. Yeah, never say never. Right? That's why I'm saying not yet. Age 21, fork in a row happened for you because you just finished your P first and you thought I was going to come back. What's the story behind that? Again, my dad likes to say this. I went to uni, but I didn't go to uni. I spent most of my time just hanging out, doing random stuff. I scored my grades, right? So there was this one lecturer who will remain nameless and subject to because I don't want him to find out. I ban you at this bus because the guy's boring, man. I will fall asleep half the time because the guy's this draggy old man. So at the end of my last year, you know, you got to submit and you got to quote and you know, citation and all that stuff. I cited one thing on me and he said, I plagiarized the people. I don't know what how it is in other countries, but in Australia, you either had to work for a couple of years and then reapply for a master's or you get accepted into an accelerated master's course. That means you score enough, you get accepted. I was accepted already, but because I was told that I plagiarized the people, I had to reset. So I ended my exam in October. So I came back for summer because summer is at the end of the year in Australia. I got the news in December to say that I have to reset. By doing that, I would have missed the accelerated masters because I had to go back in March and reset the paper. And then I would have to stay in Melbourne till the end of the year for me to do that master, if I pass the paper, which I did. So my dad was like, yes, but the problem is my dad's right. My dad said, I'm going to pay you for nine months to stay in Melbourne to do nothing. Come back. So that was the huge fault in the road, right? It was at that point in time, something changed the course of my life because if I had stayed for the accelerated masters, I probably would have ended up working there for the days. But when you were locking up the door, you told everyone, I'll be back. Yep. Why didn't you turn back? I haven't been back since. Yeah, why not? What happened? Number one, visa to Australia is hard now because there's too many Malaysians overstaying. Guys come back. Second, I came back and because I graduated, my dad said, no, look, go to work. You can do your master's later. You know that whole idea, you're young, you're 21, you're saying you can always defer it to later and later is now 20 years, literally, and I haven't gone back. I haven't gone back to Melbourne. I've gone to Sydney. But I haven't gone back to Melbourne. I was telling myself, I want to go to Melbourne this year. I've been saying that for 20 years now. I have my visa, but I haven't had time because these people are keeping busy. You know, the people behind the camera, really. So I came back and I got offered to work in Accenture at the time. And I, I didn't know what the heck consulting was, really. It sounds like a bunch of people just talking to each other, really. But I've always been a business guy, a businessman, not founder, not entrepreneur. Because even when I was young, when I was six, seven years old, I was selling comic books to my friends. And the reason why I stopped selling for a while is because I, had, I have an elder brother who is one of the most prolific comic book collectors in Malaysia till today. Back then, how comic books for young children or young preteens is to say, look, just put your book in my bag. The shop will have a bag. But every week when a comic book releases, whether it's Spider-Man, Superman, Wonder Woman, they will put the book in the bag. So his book in the bag became huge because we got allowances, right? To the point that the store called my mom and said, your son owes this much money. And she's like, what's going on? Why are you spending this kind of money? Then what got worse was there was this rule, don't sell stuff like this to families because it's a collectible product. So if she won of, say, Ghost Rider or Spider-Man, and I buy it for, say, 10 ringgit at the time, and because it's sold out and they're not going to do another printing, then it goes up to, say, 15 ringgit in a couple of months. So I would sell it for 15 ringgit because that's the market price, right? So if I were to sell it to my cousin, and my cousin then says, I bought a 15 ringgit comic, and the mom says, it says here two ninety nine. why did you overpay this? Who did you buy it from? You know, that's another sort of my comfortable situation with family dinners and lunches. So I stopped for a while, but I, I always like to buy and sell and trade stuff with my friends and family members. It's not the economy. The economy obviously excites me, but more of the fact that there was an inherent value in product that people would think is junk. 
So why did you decide to launch your first luxury automobile? Oh, I love cars. Not when I was young. When I was young, I like comic books, I like trading cards, I like toys, you know, like the geeky kid who can't play football. I don't watch football at all. I don't know what to do. I, I just can't stand watching 10 men chasing after one ball. That's me, right? I just don't get it. Between the ages of 18, 19, when I got my license, that was the time that there's this really, really big automotive show that blew up in the UK called Top Tier. And this really, really well-known and very incendiary presenter called Jeremy Clarkson. And I knew Clarkson because my eldest brother is a car fan. When I visited him in the UK, he would watch this car show. He was watching it and he was reviewing it in 1994, I think, It was the Ferrari F355, which was also incidentally in the movie The Rock with Nicolas Cage and Sean Connery where he was crashing a brand specking new yellow F355 Spider, which is a convertible, through the streets of, I don't know, San Francisco. I don't remember the scene. And if you haven't watched it yet, watch it, because this one scene is legendary. And the guy's like, oh, dude, you just crashed your Ferrari. It's not mine. Because he stole the car. I'm like, I, I, I love this car. I want this car. My first magazine I bought when I was 14 had a Ferrari on the cover. And then when I started knowing cars, I fell in love with not just the car, but the brand, right? Because the brand is old. So when I came back to Malaysia, I'm like, okay, there's a gap in the market. There are a lot of old automotive magazines, which is either Malaysian and the quality was okay, but they're not exactly the, the ones that the American, the English ones do. Or you take up a franchise and then you call it a brand, say Top Gear, and you put the word Malaysia at the end of it, right? And I said, we can do this also. Back then, magazines had their glossy cover. I didn't like glossy covers. I always liked that matte theme. But to do a matte cover costs you more because you've got to print it as a gloss and then you wrap it in a matte wrapping. I didn't know that. It's, I, I don't come from a publishing background. All I wanted was something that looked cool that I enjoyed doing. So I started that magazine with a bunch of random friends from college who also has zero experience in publishing. I found the photographer through a random meet somewhere. He was taking photos, taking a photographer, and being amazing at it. And became a prolific photographer till today. And I launched the magazine on my birthday. It just happened that we were supposed to launch it in, in Femme. Ended up because we didn't know how to print. It came out in my issue in 2005. I didn't know anyone. So how would I get cars? Because if you don't have cars, you don't have content. So I speak to friends who knew people who own cars. And, and I, I will never forget this. The guy who took a chance on us was the one running at that time. Ferrari in Malaysia was run by a company called Next Car, run by a Singaporean. And they also own Bentley. So at the time, Bentley was doing, I know it sounds a bit off, an affordable Bentley. Because Bentleys at the time were three, four, five million ringgit. And this was a 1.5 million ringgit Bentley. Affordable in the realm of Bentley. And they gave the car to us to meet. So we had that on the cover and everything. What do we put on the back of the cover? Because you need to put ads. We don't have ads. Why do we do front of the cover at the front of the car? And at the back is the back of the car. So the front and the back of the magazine is the car. And that was the magazine called Get a Car. How do you sell yourself? I, I knew one of the guys who was a general manager for the outlet because I, I used to hang out there a lot. And he says, okay, like this young kid wants to try and, you know, make a dent in the universe. Let's give him a shot. And, but because Bentley was on my first issue, it subsequently got easier to get the other manufacturers to say, look, yeah, play, give him a try. Is that how you got Tansu Shan Suding? Actually, I got Shariman. Is it Dato now? Sorry. So Shariman, I think Dato. So, sorry, if I got your title wrong, I'm just going to call you Shariman because I know him as, as Shariman back then. So Shariman, which is uh, actually Subsidy's brother, launched Sapra Auto in 2006, 2007. Now, if you rewind yourself back in the early 2000s, at that time, the main dealer was Auto Bavaria. It still probably is Auto Bavaria today. But back then, they were trying to give out the rights to open up into other states. So Ipoh had one and Johor had one. And Sapura opened up Ingress. So if you rewind yourself 20 years ago, Malaysia didn't have all these cool, fancy cars from major manufacturers. The high-performance BMWs, which are called BMW M, or in Mercedes nomenclature, it's AMG, or as the Germans pronounce it, AMG, didn't have any Ms. But when Sapura launched, they had Ms. So I was like, wow, I've never seen these cars. And we're like, okay, this is super cool. And because of the magazine, we became fast friends. I love him. He's an amazing guy. I drove around the Sepang circuit with him and the car sort of died on me. Sorry for that. Really. Well, not my fault. Car died. But my most distinct memory of Shariman was, it was a Sunday afternoon, 3 p.m. And I was watching Formula One at the time. He calls me up and he says, hey, bro, you want to go to Germany? No. I'm like, okay, when? Tonight. Okay, but don't have to pack. Forget about packing, man. Just go. Let's go to Germany. Let's go and drive for the Nürburgring. So the Nürburgring Nordschleife, or known as the Green Hell, is one of the most legendary circuits known to man. Because it is the longest circuit. One, one lap is like 15, 20 minutes. And he says, let's go. I'm 22 at the time. I still need to get my parents' approval. Do I tell him that I got to ask my parents, right? I won't sound cool, right? And he was like, no, let's go, let's go. I'll take care of it. Let's just fly and just enjoy the M drive. So it was a bunch of 
owners and of course himself and some of his friends who would go and then drive around the Nürburgring that is actually organized by BMW M. This is a dream come true, right? For some reason, I don't remember why I didn't end up going, which is one of the, my most, I guess, missed moments of my life because I've driven in most of the Formula 1 circuits in the world through my experience driving the Magali, except the actual notice cycle, the main track. Because when you run a car magazine, and still is today, I think, they will send you around the world to drive and test these cars in some of those fanciest hotels. They never fly you less than business class. You're treated like kings, right? One of my favorite sessions was I sat with the owner, as in the family of BMW, over dinner, I think in Lake Como. I'm like, whoa, this is a dream. My magazine not making money, but I can say I met the founder of BMW. Or at least one children of BMW, right? Yeah. Why do you say no? I think my mom said no. Well, so the four after you almost died, riding shotgun, driving fast out of 90. So that was when I was 18. That was before I learned how to drive properly. It was just a, a young child with a fast car thinking that he's better than anybody else. And that happened in a small parade. It was at Turnoff. Coming from SGMC, that, that medical center, so it was a long trade road and a nice sharp turn in the small parade. I was driving with my friend. And see, don't do this, kids. Back then in the day, your, your car won't ding when you don't wear singles. This is what, 99, 2001, 2000. So because the car doesn't annoy you for not wearing seatbelts, your friends will annoy you by saying, hey, why are you wearing a seatbelt? You don't trust my driving? So it becomes this weird thing that nobody wears seatbelts, right? So then we were driving really quickly down that straight road, me and my friend. I remember this very, very clearly. I was trying to turn, it was driving really fast. It's what you call terminal understeer, because the car is a front wheel driven car, not a rear wheel driven car. As you turn the wheel at full lock, the car just goes through. So the car literally flew, and I swear to you, I was saved by a palm tree. Because I shit a palm tree. I, and, and as I was flying, I thought I was done for because the car went up like this. So I saw the sky. I thought, oh. And everything moved in slow motion, right? Okay, I'm going to die now, right? I'm hungry. That was the thing that crossed my mind. I want sausage with muffin or something like that, right? Because it, it was a rage that I need to tell you. I tell you, I guess it was meant to be. Because of the tree that I hit, it slowed down my velocity. I would have then crossed to the other road. This road is two lanes jumped into it. Now, I could have died in three ways. I could have not hit the tree, crossed into the other lane, a car would have hit me. That would have been a frontal impact. And I wasn't wearing seatbelt, therefore I could. Second, because I wasn't wearing seatbelt, I could have flown out anyway. Thirdly, literally a car dropped nearly one and a half or two feet away from a spawn drain, which would have literally just crashed in a little bit. Okay? But that's not the best part. The best part is the funniest thing that happened. So as the car landed on the ground and there was smoke everywhere. I think the airbag deployed. I panicked and I just got out because it was smoke, right? You know, and I think I just got out of the car and just went out, leaving my friend. I mean, at that point in time, not to be a bad friend, you should be about saving your own ass, right? Yeah. And then suddenly I hear my friend yelling, holy shit, he loses his leg or what? He's calling my name. Bro, where are you, bro? I'm like, I'm outside. Bro, I thought you got thrown out of the window. <laughs> so he's like, are you okay? And I'm like, I'm fine. I had no scratches, nothing on me. And he's like, Oh, okay, okay, I'm buying two. Do you know the rear view mirror? The rear view mirror was stuck on his head. He hit his head while the car was flying. And he was stuck. He had uh, six switches. It's amazing for me that you went through something like that, which must have been traumatizing. And you threw the car. You even did a magazine around cars. I think because I used to get into a lot of accidents when I was young. <laughs> I'm, I'm a clumsy guy. But even driving, I used to get into a lot of accidents. There was one time I said, look, I'm done driving. I think when I was 17, I told my mom and dad, I said, look, I don't want to drive anymore because I don't want to get into accidents. I mean, they're not major accidents, but just fender bender parking, you know, saying it. Then I'm like, oh, but I'm done with this. It's, I don't think I'm meant to drive, right? And they said, no, you keep on going, keep denting the car because one day you'll be okay to drive properly, right? Ever since then, I realized that all you need to do is if you're really bad at something, just get really good at it. So because of the car magazine, I went to racing school, I learned how to do better driving. It sounds very interesting. And I'm going back to program publishing as well. When you started, it sounds as though I'm just interested in something. Let's just find a bunch of friends. Let's just do it. Let's just figure it out. There's no plan. But you did not help that by the fact that I still didn't know anything about this on the street, which I think most people are. How did you figure out back then? How do you start? To me, I believe the less you know, the better. Because then you just do it and worry about how you solve the problem later. Because a lot of us, we get into this, what is that line, right? Analysis paralysis. Oh, yeah. Yes. You know, you analyze, you analyze, you analyze, you paralyze, and nothing happens. I hate that. I'm like, let's just shoot from the hip and build the plane as you're flying it. Since I was young. Because you'll solve the problem. I have supreme anxiety. 
I, I guess I don't have the best temper. I guess my team can attest to it. What I'm about to say was actually inspired by one of my team members in Paragon. Because at that point in time, I thought I knew everything. Uh, yeah. Again, Paragon alpha male, with the mentality thinking, you know, I own the company, therefore I pay you a salary. You work for me, you do as I say. This guy came up to me and says, hey man, if you're hiring us, and I'm not trying to be difficult here, but if you're not going to listen to us, why hire? At that time, I got pissed. But then when I reflected upon it later, and that sort of built my persona as a better manager, I think I wrote down Quora as well, is you can never be a good leader until you've learned how to follow. Because when I came back from Australia, the first thing I did was I started my own company, and so therefore I was already a boss. Again, a lot of that mentality of, I pay you salary, you work I guess today, Generation Alpha, right? They don't care about money anymore. It's about quality of money. And it took a while to understand this. When I closed my first company, I had to work for someone. Everybody around me was only talking about bonus. Work hard, keep your KPIs, get bonus. They're doing it like drones. Just before you close down, you actually learned the importance of hiring. Oh, okay, that's my core one, yes. Mm, yes. Clearly, I read through everything. I will share this <laughs> clip with you, Chris, because this is about you. So I love this guy. His name is Chris. He's got this amazing personality that Everybody falls in love with it. Also because he's devastatingly handsome. You know, I'm jealous. Lah. So obviously he got the attention of all the fair ladies around the office. But he's horrible with time management. Because he parties every night, really. And I know that. and tells me. But because he's doing sales, I'm okay, right? So you can go and see the car guys, the ads guys, whenever you like it. Because they're not exactly the ones that wake up in the morning. Right? People around him realized that I was giving him leeway to miss me. Again, being my first time leader, I didn't know. All I knew was I liked this guy, he could do sales and people liked him and we, we generally get along. So imagine a guy who's never on time and then finally missing, because at that time I had three magazines already at the time. One of them was a contract magazine we did for one of the big GLC. And he missed that meeting for the first issue of us launching that magazine. And he was supposed to talk about ad revenue because we were supposed to share the revenue. This is bad. I could talk about it, but I wanted him there because he's the one who's going up. So then the team called me, he said, look, Fizz doesn't even give a shit when you're there. So this is what he's doing to your clients. So can you imagine if he's late for your clients and what is he thought? Ellen New made it. And the clients are going to complain to you, but they can complain to the other magazines or the other media house. No, okay. Let's chat with him. Again, never firing anybody, never even have the hard conversation. I said, Chris, what do we do now? You're never on time. Sometimes you disappear. You're uncontactable. You know, I'm cool. You're partying and all, but can you keep it to the weekends? Why do you have to party every day? I said, yeah, no. Yeah, okay, okay, okay. I think I'll do better. I said, so what do I do now, right? I push it back to you. I said, no, no, give me another chance. I'll prove myself to you. I said, okay. Next meeting, don't be late. So next meeting, he was late again. And then the team was just with pitchfork. And I'm like, oh, okay, Chris, let's have the hard conversation again. So what do I do now? You're late when it's supposed to be on time for you because you're bringing money. If ads don't come in, forget about the money. So I said, no, what am I going to do now? Can you, you can't help yourself. He says, we'll do this. I promise you tomorrow onwards, I'll be here at 9 a.m. every day. If I am late, I will fire myself. And then the next day, the guy walks in at 12 o'clock. <laughs> and he fired himself. He fired himself. But it was the saddest moment of my life at that point in terms of career because I really liked the guy. He could do a good job. That's one of the balancing acts you have to do as a manager is to manage people. You know the line they say, right? Manage people and the business will manage itself. Did it change your manager yourself after Chris left? I got worse because apparently I brought in a guy who was a whip everybody hated who literally put a snake bit in the office he had a albino python which one day disappeared it was somewhere in the office which is another fun joke and I didn't know he was caustic I liked him too right so clearly I've got a bad judge of character which I realised much later <laughs> the team was upset we did one very very huge event at the end of that year I think 2007 2008 where we closed off a portion of Putrajaya and made it into a street circuit I think no one has ever done it before or since but we brought in all these manufacturers, we had Porsches, we had all these high-end cars from the manufacturers and everybody could drive them, all the high-end net wealth clientele because we were high-end magazine, right? We had to work two out four days. So imagine doing a race event with 150 participants, intense heat, demanding sponsors, guys were paying money to get it done, right? And at the end of it, maybe I wasn't being grateful enough, maybe I was not being cognizant that these are people who literally put blood, sweat and tears to make it work. Because I would have outsourced him to what essentially would have been my CEO, right? My number two. And they all hated it. Literally. Till today. At the end of that session, I gave them three days off. And when they came back, I had 30 of them in the meeting waiting for me, resigning in mass. They told me, look, we love the company. We love what we're doing. We're cool with you. But the fact that you chose this guy and choose to listen to him despite A, B, C, D, E, F, G is done. We don't want to 
How did you react to that? I was angry, upset, worried about the deadline because we have a magazine to publish. So you couldn't stop them? I stopped, I think, two or three guys. But we're still friends till today. But I, I have to admit, I didn't spend the time to understand them as people. I see them as friends because we hang out, we chill out. But when it comes to work, I guess I become that taskmaster and, and it takes up the joy of work. Would you say that particular incident made it impossible for your company to continue? Yeah, I mean, it wasn't impossible, but because of that, we had to slowly size down. We, and then double whammy, the 2008 financial crisis came. And when the 08 financial crisis came, advertising spend just grinded to a halt. Everybody was panicking and smaller boutique media houses like ours would be the last on the totem pole to even get hands because we don't have the eyeballs for it. Nobody buys magazine. And because of that, we realized, okay, look, we're going to sort of downsize. Then there was a smaller media boutique that says, look, we'll take you out. You say, okay. Then the realization of what the hell do I do in my life now? Now I had to go and find work, really. And I haven't worked for anyone before. Yeah. So you end up in Groupon. What was it like going from being your boss to working for someone for a paycheck? At that time, I realized culture of Groupon was something that I found unique because here were a bunch of guys younger than me. The, the culture of play hard, work hard, Groupon, solid. Like they were working hard, but they were also very, very professional in terms of the delivery as well. I look at Joel, who was probably, what, 29, 28 at the time, building a company that was doing, while I was there, 300 million a year. Because Groupon was the biggest group buying site, obviously, but also one of the first progenitors of e-commerce. In Malaysia, that was the foyer, the Zadas and Shopee's of the world. And, and that was before anybody even trusted paying anything online, right? So we had to create a new generation of buyers. I mean, other than the ones who study overseas and buy on Amazon, yeah, we wouldn't do that. But the average Malaysian, still today, still has issues transacting online. It's just this immense pleasure to have served in a company that everybody has a unified vision, goal, and is singularly driven to be, you know, the traditional way of doing business. What were some of the trademark ways of beating everyone back? You know, Russell Taylor's came out of Groupon. He was probably enabling and bringing stuff up in China at the time. And we were basically beating your big box stores. These are guys, you know, selling stuff out of their garage or bedroom, selling millions a month to Malaysians. This is essentially us breaking the mold, not just Groupon as a platform, but the sellers. All of a sudden, you, as a person working a full-time job, could be having a friend buying, you know, 50 grand worth of pen drives and making 100 grand or whatever it was. And we saw that. You were creating a generation of entrepreneurs that never thought they could have been entrepreneurs, who today are real entrepreneurs. Some quite the Groupon DNA. Yeah. How would you describe that? So the Groupon Mafia, the Groupon DNA. So the ones that were there at that point in time, that, that huge lightning. And Chen Chao was there as well, working for the big Groupon. Chen Chao, me, Joel, Rafik, who's now the Prima. Anisha Slim was in LinkedIn. There's a bunch of us. Poovan and Nash who became my co-founders in Lima Last, right? There were easily 20 to 30 people who then became their own entrepreneur in their own right because of Groupon. I guess you're inspired because you're saying, hey, here's Joel, he's 28, 29, doing really well. And you have gone through that journey with that person. It means, hey, if I fail and I do a 30 million and get your business, hey man, let's go. You said before Rafik Razali. He was country GM at the time, and he used to do the the web app call with you guys. Oh, yeah. What was it like? Because he apparently said that it was game-changing, that he would set the tone for everyone. I remember that, man. Eight o'clock in the morning. Okay, guys, what do you have to do? Okay, local, what are you doing today? What are you selling today? What's your target? Okay, product, what are you doing today? Okay, travel, I was doing travel. What are you doing today? I don't think anybody wants to be in that call, Rafi. I don't think you want to be in that call. But because it was a cadence, you would have set that early nine o'clock in the morning call at the very least to know, holy shit. The product team is doing better than me now in terms of GMV. I've got to check. And that was essentially a culture that we probably got from Rocket Internet because when I should have joined Rocket, that was the same shit they were doing. In the pandemic situation, it makes sense. But to, to basically do it daily means there's only so much you can do. If you're doing any e-commerce business today, and you should have a steering meeting at least once a week, in my opinion. At what point did you decide, I'm ready to start my own thing again? So if you rewind to 2014, 2015, Digital News Asia at the time was one of the main sites I was I would read. So shout out to Karam. So there was an article that came out and I could be wrong here. Gauteng.com raised half a million dollars. The co-founder of Gauteng was my senior. Jeff. Uh, Jeff. Wow. So you got lawyers, right? Wow. That's so interesting. Because I've, I've tried to raise money through Credo. Mm. On and off when I was in Groupon, we tried to do some cool stuff, but we couldn't get the funding at the time. So then I said, okay, I want to do something in this. At that time, there was what I thought was huge startup in the US called Magic. 
which was doing an on-demand, anything you wanted, by SMS. So I'm like, I don't have a tech guy. SMS can work. Okay, so let me find a couple of co-founders. At that time, my co-founder, Nesh, was in between jobs. And because he was in between jobs, he could be fully into this job. We came up with a lot of names, man. We wanted to copy the name Magic because we think if we copy the name Magic, we can get funny easier because everybody's looking at comparables, right? So we think about what to do and then we came up with the name Go CK, which is Magic in Malay. Then someone texted, bro, is this a Bobot service or what? Right? So we were like, okay, we got to change the name, guys. And then we're thinking, what are we doing? Okay, we're serving people who are essentially lazy to go out. We're helping people solve a big problem because I don't want to go and wait in the bank for two hours for my ticket to be called or line up at my cinema amongst them. There was no Grab delivery back then. Grab was my taxi, just a taxi car service. There were on-job guys who were dispatch riders, but they would dispatch only documents because they were working for companies. This is Gojet. Gojet wasn't even there. I mean, I mean, there was Goget. Goget was there. Francesca was there. And we were thinking, we don't want to own the riders. I just want to be the frontline service to be the American Express black concierge, but for affordable months. That was the idea. So we started off literally off my kitchen table, me and Nesh. We didn't have a tech co-founder, right? So we jigged up something from an SMS platform that we routed to a Samsung phone, which I think I still have. Our original Samsung phone that we're replying text. And we're thinking, I wonder who will use this service. How will you charge it? Again, shooting from the hip, no idea what we're doing. I started with, I think, 20 grand or 30 grand. Me and my dad's money, right? Thanks, dad. So then we hired Nash for a bit just to keep him. I think we started for about a week or two. And then it blew up because when he posted, if you need anything done, just text his number. And he posted it in the mummies group. So mummies are perfect customer persona because if you're going to your pantang or your confinement period, you cannot go out. You're stuck. And if your husband is working, it makes it worse. So they need a lot of stuff done. But they trusted you, this random person from nowhere? It was on a Facebook group. We said, look, get, we get it done for you. You know, you're right. I didn't think about the trust issue at all. I don't know why it worked. <laughs> Maybe Nash looks very friendly. Maybe put my face there, it wouldn't have done so well. It worked. One of the girls took trust on us. I think it's also because she's my wife's friend. And she's prolific in that group. So because she said, guys, use this. They got me all these things. And then everybody started using us, right? So at the end of the first month, we blew up mainly just Nash, who delivers, who picks up, who sorts out the orders, who replies texts, who were having like 10, 15 texts a day, which is a lot for one person to handle. And they were requests. Then we said, okay, this is time for us to probably look at raising money. Where will we go? I have no idea. So at the time, another friend of mine was doing a laundry startup, a laundry on-demand startup. Back then, everything was do Uber for something, right? So there was this little Uber for laundry. And then he went to Singapore and he wanted to do the same thing there. He met a Japanese investor who said he was looking for an Uber of laundry or an Uber of something. It's Koichi side. Koichi, yeah. So he says, look, I don't want to lose this laundry stuff. But I got a friend doing an on-demand startup in KL. We got to talk to him. So he connected me to Koichi through LinkedIn. And I'm like, I don't know whether this is real because this is so easy. You know, typical Malaysian mentality is everything must be hard. If it's easy, it's a scam. You know, so I'm like, okay, this is real. Okay. He says, I want to come to KL to see you. Can I meet you? And I remember that very, very succinctly. This is 2015, 2014. This is before anybody has the chance to Google term sheet. How do you look at valuation? Nobody knows. So I only knew what I wanted to raise based on my projection. And I wanted to raise half a million ringgit because at that time, that was what Prado was giving up. So I want to raise half a million ringgit to do this business. And I think that was more than enough because I had Nash and I think I had two more guys. Two new guys. Cool. Just finished uni. So here I was meeting Kuichi, showing him my projections with another one of my co-founders at the time, but he left. He's in Texas now. He's Malaysian Chinese, spent most of his years in Texas, comes back with a weird twang that ain't Texan nor American. So pitch the idea saying you want half a million ringgit. Kuichi looks at us and says, okay, I will give you half a million US. And I'm like, what do we do? Half a million dollars? Like, our model didn't have that. And I'm like, so are you going to give us half a million yourself? Or how? Because I don't know, right? I don't know how a deal is that. And he says, no. I will find other co-investors and I will make sure that the round is half a million dollars with a valuation of two million at a time. Okay, um, we bring, I will bring one super angel from Singapore, a Japanese guy, and I'll bring in Credo. And I'm like, oh, but we went to Credo before and they said no for a different startup we're doing. He said, no, no, don't worry. I'll help you because we have a co-investment. At that time, Credo was doing a co-investment with a few foreign investors for equity because Credo is not known to take equity. They're known to give you grants. So this is the first and only time, I think, they were doing equity investment at sea. So we wanted to show that got it. We will do it. So give me a bank account. When someone gives you US dollar, you need a US dollar denominated account. So he says, okay, never mind. Don't worry about it. The term sheet, later we do. 
I'll wire the money first. So I'm like, what? He wired the money faster than I could open the bank account. You Google it. The fastest to raise money based on brace wax because my nephew needed brace wax and Nash was the Bima last rider. I really like the name. We call it Rajin Runner. So the person who's Rajin will run for you. But then my other founder, Puvan, changed it to something to do with you assisting you as a valet, which makes sense, but a bit too highbrow because we were mainly at the time of dating them. And yeah, half a million dollars came in. I can share this publicly because I literally just spoke to Kuichin person two to three weeks ago on this. The ringgit to USD was 3.7 when you signed the term sheet. But when the money came through a week later, the rate jumped to 4.1 or 4.2. When I had my first board meeting and I only spent 30 grand a month because my burn was small, I mean, 20 grand a month, right? Koichi was like, why don't you spend it every month? I did, but we gained money for Forex. He says, if you're not spending money, then don't raise venture money. You need to use venture money to scale. Again, I come from the mentality of I make a buck and I'll keep 20 cents to use to scale or to build a business. That was my lesson learned in terms of how to build a business with dry powder. That means you're scaling it inorganically, right? Because you've got investment money. So before we talk about how you use it for that money, Koichi, he had been working as a VC for two years. He said it's the fastest time that he actually signed on an entrepreneur. He agreed in two days. Yep. I have to wonder what on earth you told him. I have no idea. I think because I came from Groupon and my co-founders were all Groupon and they were the biggest tech company in Asia at the time. So of course you've got that aura of these guys have done it. So if they've done it once, you know, you think that they can possibly replicate it. You know? must have seen him sit up and I sparkle when you say certain things. So it really resonates with him. I guess, but Koichi is a very good poker face. <laughs> Until today, Koichi, I can't tell. These guys have, have met him. I've known him for what, 10 years now? So Koichi invests in founders. And these are the best seat founders because you're betting so early. You have to bet on the fact that these guys are the right guys to scale the business because they can be good entrepreneurs, but they're in the wrong lane. And that's what most of the guys don't understand. Just because you fail the business doesn't make you a bad entrepreneur. It just makes you an entrepreneur that is in the bad business. So at that point in time, one is hedging the bet that, okay, these guys come from a tech company, they know how to scale, and Groupon scaled hyper fast. These guys seem to know what they're talking about. And I think ultimately it's more of the personalities involved. Mm. Every one of us had different distinct personality. Yeah. So one was mainly in ops, which is proven. Another one was mainly in marketing, which is Nash. And I was the chief everything officer, whatever the guys didn't do, I would do. And I think it's also because of the model. So most businesses are also looking at me two models. Now, I don't think everybody would do it in two days, but they would want to rush the investment because they don't want to lose out. The fear of missing out is real in, in, the, in the investment scene. They want to get in early enough so that their valuations are much more reasonable for them so that they can get an exit. I wonder... Again, you were building something from scratch. I think pricing must have been really difficult because every single thing that it was doing, it ranged from getting coconuts, her cave all to the most random things in the world. And you say that you don't even know how much it's going to cost at the end because a simple task might take a very long time. How did you even figure something out and get so many requests? I saw somewhere in your first month, you got 1,800 requests. Yeah. Which is really, really fast. And then 15K revenue in the first two weeks. Yeah. Some of the requests are just getting something and then dropping it off, which was why the volume of 1,800 is there. It was not easy, yeah. though. It was something like, I want the best nothing in the mind. Yeah. That takes time. It's crazy. Which is why it's a completely inelastic business where it could either cost you 10 ringgit or 10,000. Yeah. We got a Malaysian request. The guy wanted us to find 100 cockroaches. And we're like, is this a joke? Legit? What? You want 100 cockroaches? Found out the guy works in a lab and he needs the cockroaches to do some tests. And we're like, well, how the hell do you find 100 cockroaches, man? I, and I hate roaches, man. I, I, I'm not going to do that. So... But did you fulfill that request? I think we did. The roaches was one. Another one, the ring was my favorite. So it was a guy who was either proposing to his potential wife or a guy who was giving his wife a gift, which is a ring. He was in London at the time and it was a specific moment that he wanted to surprise her because she knows he's in London. So he told us, can you buy this ring for me? We'll transfer you the money. And we were charging, I think, a 10% fee or something to handle it. And then we surprised her at the door by giving the ring. Would you say that unique part of what you were offering is also the thing that caused you to not be able to scale so fast? Because you could scale it. Yeah, so this hope. So because it's so bespoke, which incidentally became the spin-off for Bimalas, the Bimalas had a bespoke element, which was the high-end one, which I, I guess because of the fact that we couldn't finish the scale because we ran out of cash, that would have probably been the profit-making one. Bespoke means you should be more. You could have someone says, I want the rice from Mabu, but I also want a cigarette on the way and get me a cup of coffee from Coffee Bee. We'll charge you for all these three requests, but it doesn't scale up because there's a limit to what you think is fair for delivery. Yeah. Of course, now, game of up. Back then, we were charging 30 ringgit sometimes because no one was doing it. So how much would you pay for your rider to send your document? Probably 30 ringgit ringgit. So the mentality was there to pay that amount. Now, no one's going to pay that amount. But back then, we could 
but we should have made more money by charging a fee, which we did on the purchase price. But the problem with that, then it will remove the requests that were high end in nature. At that time, Ikea didn't deliver. And no one likes shopping in Ikea. Okay, the lines are long. So they used us to buy Ikea. And we had hundreds and thousands of Ikea orders. I seen values, not ordered orders, because they never came online. But we couldn't charge them for the Ikea. Because if you're buying, you know, five, six grand worth of Ikea furniture, I'm not going to use this again. But then it is time intensive. It requires you to have a truck because it's big. We have to deliver for you, right? So the model inherently is flawed, which is why I think no one has ever made it work. Grab is doing it because they are basically a transportation app first, which means the last be able to find the best. Exactly. Yeah. That's true. But you can find the best as in the market because they integrate commerce element to me. Yeah. Which ultimately is what we should have become if we hadn't grown in that manner. Today, people still come up to me and say, bro, I don't want to go and line up. You know, there was one guy who asked me this. He says, I have to go and do a stand-in tomorrow for a wedding course. We have to stay for two days. Can I pay him to stand-in to me? I paid 2,000 bucks. He wasn't there. That's money. <laughs> yeah, two grand. So that's the unique kind of services that a concierge can provide. Because it's high touch, I think that should remain a high touch business model. Yeah. So going back again, you were told by your board, you need to start spending. How did you figure out how to spend 500,000 in USD at the time? We knew that we had to hyperscale because Groupon, Rocket, they're known to launch one market every three, four months. Yeah. They would put a launcher, then the person would just go there, they launch the market, and then they start, and then they scale. So we said, let's do the same thing. But of course, being the hyper-competitive person that I am, let's do it once every two months. So we expanded Singapore two months later. We expanded the Philippines that I remember someone squatted on bimalas.co.ph. So everything routed to him, and he was doing the same business. We went to Indonesia. We went to Brunei, because no one goes to Brunei. The four countries in that first year. Ironically, Brunei was one of our best markets, because he had the propensity to spend like Singapore would do but they're not as discerning as Singaporean customers. Singapore customers to pay $5 delivery is when you complain. And if the food isn't warm, complain. And it's a very tricky market crack because the level of customer service is so high where if you mess up something, you might get a refund. It just doesn't make any economic sense to function as a startup. If you're a legitimately sized you know, conglomerate, yeah, for sure. But for a startup, no. we lost a lot of money here. Would you say that Singapore office was a it was a huge mistake because we rented a table for four thousand sing dollars a table because we couldn't afford us an office space or three thousand dollars i can't remember it was a table like this in an office that clearly funny enough looks like this the green wall in oh it, it looks like this <laughs> right and we had four guys five guys we were burning a lot of cash in singapore and the volume of orders was just not there so you should have focused on malaysia i should have just focused on malaysia and moved to johor Penang because a lot of us think oh malaysia is just only kale or plan money but we investors have been happy though. Uh, that's another question mark. But I think a lot of the investors today are more cognizant that Malaysia is more than this Penguin, which I guess is more important because if you don't win your own home term, don't even think about going to another market. It's a whole other set of problems. But are you supposed to also have the lens of, okay, we need to also expand the regional market because it's not that big as compared to if you were in Indonesia. And that's fine, you should just focus on your country. You wouldn't expand to Indonesia if you're using your own money. You would use your money to get profitability first, get comfortable with the operations here, and then say, look, maybe I'll put a portion of my money into another country. But because you're doing it at scale and you need to scale and then gain more valuation and raise more money, then most entrepreneurs, including myself back then, were forced to scale. Not because my investors forced me to scale, but it was the name of the game for me to get better valuations. I've got to be in more than one country. A Malaysian-only startup is just not sexy enough to attract global money. Would it have been better for you to just focus on Malaysia before raising more funds then? It definitely would have. But you got to look back in 2015. The infrastructure for on-demand delivery just wasn't there. Yeah. So I was working with Francesca. So go get was my last mile. Really. Then I've got to pay for the delivery service. And then I've got to pay for the customer service team that was essentially 24 hours a day to, to handle requests. Again, too ambitious. I had to acquire customers, which means I had to subsidize some deals. So it was a massive burn to reach critical mass. So if the mass of users become big enough, then by the volume of orders, then I could finally see some level of break-even. But to get there, and you're just spending a lot of money. So I raised another round. We raised half a million dollars. Then we raised another half a million bridge round from some very interesting VCs. Room. One of them is was led by an American VC, which has changed his name now. And the most interesting one was a company called Dina. It's, it's written as Dina, but it's pronounced DNA, which is a huge public listed entity out of Japan. It was the first time I that. Uh, I think so, yeah. Yeah, them and Phoenix and yeah. RIMU. Yeah. Remo didn't invest beyond us, so they were a family office in Singapore. 
DNA owns Nintendo. I don't know what they saw in us, but they like the concept of, I guess, disrupting a market that needs disrupting, yes, because it was, again, a nascent ecosystem with fully integrated delivery and demand. I guess no one really, and no one being me and my team, probably didn't want to look at is for us to be able to build our vision of being a completely integrated on-demand concierge for an affordable price, you need a hundred million dollars. But we didn't think about that. We're thinking we'll get there, we'll get there, cut our burn and we'll get there. So again, first time rodeo raising money. You know, we thought we're going to get to the next round. We always think that we're going to get to the next round because there's always going to be a gravy train and then winter fun hit. Okay. So that was it. At what point did you realize that I need to get up this train? When we just literally just couldn't pay our bills, right? Because we had a 16, 17 man operation. It was huge. We cut off Singapore early because we realized the burn was too high. But Malaysia to maintain the country itself to have a 24 hour customer service because at that point in time I think we had an on-demand fleet of riders for ourselves because the demand was becoming a, a bit too intense so we couldn't work with a third party because they have their own deliveries to do as well right so they wouldn't prioritize us and that was costly because if I have guys on demand waiting for deliveries and then suddenly deliveries don't happen I'm just paying them salaries for nothing you know not doing much I'm not getting revenue out of them so I'm not sweating the asset and that was tricky. The model in and of itself is just too complex and too many potential okay. failure points and variables, which is why no one has literally solved that concierge on demand until today. When you close a company down, there must be so many things that you have to manage. The funders, your own staff. Talk us through what it's like. Because we often hear about, oh, our staff has failed. But we don't hear about what that actually means for the founder going through that process and all the things you have to settle. I got to go back and work again. Where am I going to even begin? It's the same thing when I finished Paragon, right? What do I do now? Now, 10 years older, however many years is that, right? But you found a job in four months. Lucky enough, because of the fact that DG at the time were looking to do their own corporate VC and they wanted to invest. And we were talking to them for a while. So they were like, hey, you know what? You're a bunch of good guys. Why don't you join us and keep on doing what you're doing in DG? That was before DGX was launched. So the failure they... is not a bad thing. Failure is definitely not a bad thing. But at the same time, Everybody should stop and breathe because sometimes you're in denial. They're like, never mind, you know, move on. There are a number of founders out there who like, no, it's okay, I feel, move on. And they don't even feel the remorse. But there really is the self-reflection to say, hey, you know, I screwed up. You know, I'm so ashamed now. My company goes down. And what made it worse is because of the fact that because I was blasted everywhere on every single media at that point in time, CNN got me. I was on Bloomberg. I was all these. I'm like, oh, I'm, I'm rocking it, right? And then suddenly I'm dead. And I'm like, I don't want anyone to talk to me. No media coverage at all, right? Because the stigma of failure in Asia isn't the way it is in the US. Maybe now it's better, but back then, people just literally kick you when you're down, especially your competitor. So Nesh joined me in Digi. Bhuvan went to join one of the companies that was sort of taking up most of our employees. So as the ship was sinking, he said, look, I'll go and join them as well to take care of my boys because those were his guys because he was taking care of Optre. I, I guess I was fortunate because... Had I joined a company that was going back to the whole rigmarole of nine to six and clock in, clock out, I would have lost my mind because I don't like that. I don't believe in that. Even the teams I need to date, I don't know when they're in the office really. You know, just get the job done, right? But leaving and joining DG, I was fortunate because the DG culture at that point in time, and I think still is today, is one of the best cultures in any culture. Just come back in your results, which is, which is an output culture. Right? And I, I had a good time. And I think the, the person I met in Niji was also an amazing visionary who literally just thought his own startup in Pakistan last year. Or was it this year? And, and raised raise one because he's got a founder mentality. And he said, come in, let's just do a HR startup and, and make it work. And we did. And it was an amazing journey. It was my first time building a tech startup out of a huge conglomerate with so many layers of approvals and so many layers of global talent. All was it, right? It was fun. I want to go back to that point of failure again. A lot of people face that all the time. How do you manage to get over that feeling of failure? Because you said before you had to reflect, it was very hard to go through. A lot of people never get out of it or they never really know how the best way to do it. So what was your way? It sounds as though you just found a job which just provided you lots of opportunities to do something and focus your mind on that. Was that the way for you? I mean, that was the result of probably being in denial and I'm not going to lie. I think I never even considered the conversation of failure for a couple of years really. And I think a lot of people don't put a lot of effort into this, which is why you don't hear a lot of failure stories. The first time I spoke about feeling was with Credo, last one, with Nesh, was Nesh. In a formal setting, this is my second time. I mean, I've spoken about failure, you know, in informal settings. The stigma of seeing, you scale too fast, you burn, see, and that sort of 
walk of shame, really. And to be honest, I don't think anyone really would have said it to my face, I mean. But it's more of the concern of, you know, being a typical Asian kid or Malaysian kid for that matter. And whenever you fell in class, they laugh at you, you know, and that sort of PTSD moments sort of ingrained in, in your behavioral set, which is why I think it was very tricky for me to embrace failure and say, yeah, I failed. I mean, I, I, I know I failed, but to say, yeah, I failed. And I'm now moving on to something else. You're right. I just soldiered on and did something else for a while until it hit me that I failed and Am I at peace with myself? So given that this is the second time you're talking about it, do you still struggle with sharing about failure? No, because I think where I'm sitting today in Endeavor, obviously I would want everyone to share. Because kudos to Tom, I didn't speak to Kuji for a while after I failed because I embarrassed, right? You know, they gave money to us and we failed. So I'll start with Tom. So Tom, and I met him and I said, look, you know, I failed so many times and I don't know whether I want to get on the horse again, you know, because it's tough, right? It's a stigma. And then Tom says, hey man, how many fathers out there hit it right on their first go. The ones who fail, the reason why their success rate is so high is because they would have at least learned from the failures. And if they did it, then obviously they won't get any subsequent investment beyond that. But if they hit it right the second or third time, it's because they never stopped trying, right? Yeah. It's like the Instacart founder, he just exited. But Instacart succeeded after 20 failures. Yeah. Prior. Overnight success after 20 failures, right? Because of the fact that you've learned every single time, but every single failure is painful because it's not just you failing, it's a bunch of guys you work with who failed. I'm fortunate because everyone in Miba Last that I work with are still very close to me today, including the ones who joined in three months before we closed. Because of that moment with Tom, I flew down to Singapore for one of the events last year and I met Koichi and I said, look, you know what, Koichi, I never said this to you formally, but I feel really, really horrible that we didn't make it work. And I wish we did. And he said, look, I don't regret a single day we gave money to you. Because to him, Despite us n- not making it work, it wasn't because we were not trying to make it work. We tried our best and failed versus, yeah, it failed because we didn't do enough. Because there were other founders that do just the bare minimum and fail and then blames everybody else. We never blame our investors. We never blamed the market. We knew that we could have done better had we planned better, had we known that this business requires an extensive amount of capital to grow, had we understood this industry better. Again, I mean, as I said, I like to shoot from the hip, right? But the truth is, even shooting from the hip it is an industry that I have zero knowledge. I'm not a logistics guy. It is, at the end of the day, a logistics and a customer service or a BPO, right? Business process outsourcing. Two industries that I either do not enjoy very much because it is a very, very manpower intensive space. You said earlier something very interesting. You're still friends with the people at VMLS. How do you manage to do that, especially given how it felt? So one of the guys, he's now in Food Market Hub, which is a huge, huge company out of Jaya One. So this guy used to work for me and he used to manage my, my customer service team, a guy named Sherwin, I love him. And he said he grew so much because of the fact that, as I said, you're, you're flying the plane as you're building it. We were all learning it as we were doing it. Trying to send deliveries, trying to manage customer service, trying to manage refunds, trying to manage credit card fraud, trying to manage different country nuances, handling firing, handling hiring. And these are kids who are 21, 22, 22 year old. So going through this huge accelerated learning process. And for me and my co-founders, we were learning this whole new universe we were not exposed to, which is the investment type and what the investors will be looking for when they're looking at a valuable startup. So you would think that if you're GMV, your gross merchandise value or your gross profit you know, in O was high enough and your net profit was still really, really poor, you could still raise money because it's the prospect growth. And that was the whole we were Uber, that whole American sort of unicorn story back then. But when the winter happened in 2017, 2018, or 2016, I can't remember what year it was, at that time, we were, were showing red, Uber was showing red without any chance of it being green in the next 10 years. All these kind of funding for growth startups no longer have the interest of investors, right? Because their fund life is only 70, which I guess goes back to the fundamental rule of business. The problem is you're burning cash, you're not making money, and you're burning someone's subsidy. It's about having a pulse on the business, meaning knowing at the very least PL. You don't need to be a damn good accountant, but you're PL. If you go out there selling, tearing in notes or firing it, you'll sell every one of them, which is essentially what startups are doing when you subsidize to acquire users, which is fine. There is a time and place to do that. But if you keep doing it for years and years and years, when you're trying to turn a profit and turn the taps on, no one's going to pay you because they're so used to paying compressed prices. So would you say, going back again to the question, how do you stay friends with all of your colleagues oh. back then? Is it because they all understood that we're all in this together, we're all figuring it out, and there was always a chance that it would fail? I think what I learned from my first mass resignation in 2007, 2008 was understanding that they are people and being genuine. Because in a world of corporate, it's always information asymmetry. Your boss knows something, you don't know. But then how come your colleague knows? 
So in me, my last, and every subsequent businesses I've been in after, everybody knows what I know. Short of everybody's salaries, but how we are in terms of sales, how we are in terms of our runway, how we are in terms of fundraising, good or bad, you know. So some people would argue and say, look, you don't want them to know if you're not raising money because this is going to stress them out because they don't know whether their paycheck is going to come in. But my point is, I would rather you know that we are going through turbulent times because then if it does happen, not for lack of trying, we did our best. Versus saying, we're going to be fine, nah, we're going to raise $10 million and it doesn't happen. You feel completely devastated. And worst of all, you won't even trust me. You're now in that very different place now. 2015, you first heard of it through the local selection panel. What was it about the LSP that drew you? So I remember in the LSP, and you should you should come to one. Please, we'll get you an invite. These two people better get you an invite, yeah. We have one every couple of months out. I remember that one. It was in CME Bank at the time. At the time, Tashi Nazir was still an active board member. He's very active now, again, but not as a board member, but as a mentor. That wasn't an endeavor yet. So I was invited by the MD of Endeavor at that time to experience what Endeavor is. And when I read up Endeavor, I'm like, wow. That's one thing I don't have because I have investors, but I don't have access to mentors. I don't have access to someone who could tell me how to do my business better because all you're surrounded by are peers who may or may not know what you do, or you may or may not want to share because you don't know what they're going to tell. Or potential mentors that may actually be actual shots who may have invested in a competitor, who may be looking at doing the same thing you are. It's a cowboy. So when I stumbled upon Endeavor, and on my left and my right at the time was VV, Fanza, so Fashion Valley also was being invited to view the LSP because they were in the running. What I didn't know was they've, they've really gone through multiple reviews. So we didn't even meet any mentors. So I'm like, what the hell? So I was very upset. I thought, okay, I know better, but turns out they knew better because I failed. And I remember this clearly. There was an entrepreneur on the other side being grilled by a very, very prolific and most in-demand mentor girl today, which is Azal. And he was grilling that guy. And I was really, really impressed because for the first time, I get to see someone telling an entrepreneur what they need to hear. Maybe it's us as Asians or Malaysians. You're always told the street stuff. And, and there, he was decimating this entrepreneur, like telling him, no, this, is, this business is not good. You don't know what you're talking about. You don't know your numbers. And I'm like, wow, this is like a firing squad, really. But I liked it because, hey, who else would be able to give you a real-world assessment of your business without any biases? Just by looking at what you've done so far and where you're going, this is what I think your business is, and this is where I think your business will end up. I met Alza many years later when I took up the role and I said, look, one of the main reasons I was truly inspired beyond the fact that there's a massive and awesome global network and most of entrepreneurs today in Endeavor will agree that his sessions are always one of the most valuable, memorable, and talked about because he's always going to bruise you because he's a contrarian viewpoint. Sorry, his contrarian viewpoint will always make you go back and think, okay, shit, he's right. I got to make a change, which is what you need. It's a jump start. You must have gone through lots of LSPs by now. What are some of the things that you've noticed entrepreneurs always fail at and always get grilled? Okay, so the main reason why entrepreneurs fail is because they don't tell a clear story. So that's another thing we realized. We just don't story tell as well as, you know, our Western friends do, right? We just, we like to tell honest stories. We don't embellish. We don't sexify things. We just say it as it is, right? We don't talk about it when getting a like Uber off. I mean, if they were to do it, they would sound very disingenuous because... They say, I'm going to build the next Uber, but they don't share the story of how they go. So when you hear all these sort of guys who are very, very, very well-versed in pitching, they will tell a story that comes with a complete suite of how they're going to get it done, which is the full story. And, and this is not saying that we've got bad entrepreneurs. We've got amazing entrepreneurs. It's just that the ones that don't get through LSP, and LSP is only one bar. You've got to go and get selected. ISP, which is an international selection panel, which is even more tough because the panelists are global, is the fact that they just seem to lack clarity of purpose, right? I'm doing this. Yes, I want to do this. I got the idea. So when someone asks you, okay, you've been doing this for 10 years, how are you going to scale 10x? From the person who's on the other side, the entrepreneur, they'd be like, I may just answer it because you're asking me a question, but I don't want to go 10x. I'm happy. I'm profitable, right? And that, and that's fine, right? An entrepreneur is an entrepreneur. You don't have to grow 10x if your business is a 10x a year business. There are businesses that are, there are businesses that are. If you're earning for 30, 40, 50 million ringgit a year and you're happy, Who's to judge you, really? You're doing a profitable business. That in and of itself is nothing to scoff at. You think it's easy building a profitable business? It's bloody hard. You don't have to be a tech entrepreneur raising, you know, millions of dollars. And to quote my chairman, Ramal says, an entrepreneur is an entrepreneur. And I like that statement. It sounds simple enough, but entrepreneur means it can come from anywhere, from any business. But to be an endeavor entrepreneur, you need to have that big vision. 
Yes, to be an Endeavor entrepreneur, which is a title you are only bestowed upon once you pass the international selection panel and you have to have that scale and multiply. The reason is because Endeavor at a global level is creating essentially market movers. That is a movement that generates thousands of jobs, that moves the GDP in multiple basis points a year, right? And to that, Endeavor's vision is to ensure that we do select wealth fitness that can get us there. And not us as in Endeavor, the countries there. In Malaysia, we've got Kasim, you know, Eric and JT, Farm Fresh, Lloyd, yeah. obviously Fashion Vene, which is Vivi and Fanza. You've got the new ones that just passed last week, Cap Bay. A billion ringgit in, you know, what they've been doing is it's insane, you know. And pass with flying colors online, no less. Online is very hard to pass because you only see the panelists in that session. When you go for physical ISPs, you have three days. You do a meet and greet, you, you meet panelists, you spend time, you have dinner with them. You know, we will lobby for panelists to speak to them, to make them understand the business better. Your entrepreneurs will have more time to handle some tough questions and before the panel. But online, you meet the panelists for an hour, you're done, you move on to the next panelist. And if they don't understand your business and they, they don't ask you the questions to clarify, you're done. And, and that's why virtual ISPs are really, really tricky for entrepreneurs to pass and double tricky because it's usually New York and American time. So we start at 8 p.m. and we end at 7 a.m. They don't have to stay till late, but I think Cat Bay stayed up till about 2 a.m. that day because their last panel was at 1. Amazing entrepreneurs, you know, shout out to you guys. Amazing, carrying the flag of this endeavor as a tip of the spear. We don't count our time and hours. As long as an entrepreneur needs help, it's not just us in Malaysia, globally. As I was telling you just before this session, you know, I met Salim Sakura of Sakura Brothers. He flew in for his business, but spent three hours to spend time with uh, Melvin from RPG Commerce, which is an amazing business. They do Monkey Go bottles and all the cool stuff that you buy online. I can't show you on camera, by the way, because I think I'll be censored, but yeah, cool stuff you do, Mel. Give me some free pads, bro. And, and give us some, too. Ah. And here's a man who's built Sakura into a global, who doesn't look at the fact that I am a huge founder, CEO of a multi-million you know, million dollar business. He wants to sit down and spend time with entrepreneurs because he thinks that at the very least he could do is to give his knowledge back. Whether you listen is up to you. Whether you execute is up to you. But I've given you the tools to do what I did to make my business a success. Whether you think my business is successful to you, again, it's subjective to you. Melvin loves him. I love him. He is a legend. It, I mean, if you could all meet him, I would want my team to meet him. He is just this amazingly inspiring person. I mean, he would turn the way you do business upside down, right? Like moving from online to offline when no one wants to move offline now, but now we are moving that trend. He was doing it years before. He has an online presence, but that's probably just to show his website and probably saw some stuff online, but his main business is always in offline. Him and his brother, which is why you're seeing a lot of these things happening now with our new sort of companies coming up. Fashion Way Group now is obviously offline store and they're everywhere. The same goes for RPG. I think I miss or we miss that simple feeling of going to a retail outlet, browsing through and then getting your products there and then. Would you ever buy a luxury handbag online? I mean, you would buy a luxury handbag. Maybe you saw it if it's and used. Go yes. Buy it. Yeah. Or, or if it's a used one you want, you can't buy a Birkin handbag, you want to buy it, you, you buy it for some like provenance. If you had a choice, you can never walk in and buy an Hermes handbag. You can never walk in and buy a Rolex Submariner or any of the sport watches. You may not have a choice. But if all of us had choice, you would want to walk in and buy. I mean, let's look at Vinu years, for example. Back then, as I said, I'm not a sports kid, right? Video games, trading cards, comic books. You would walk in and then browse through all the games. And then, you know that feeling, that almost ASMR feeling of opening up that thing and it does that brand new smell. Back then, you probably have videotapes, cassettes, and then moved on to CDs and then DVDs and then Blu-rays. And then now everything is digital. So to what end, really? How many cars today have a CD player inside it? What do I do with my old CDs? I don't know. I don't want to sell them because these are memorabilia to me, right? I bought the CD when, you know, I, I had my first kiss or whatever, right? Now, if an album comes out from your favorite artist, will you remember when you heard it the first time on Spotify? You won't because you'd have to line up and buy the CD. No one lines up to buy iPhones anymore. No one buys iPhones every year anymore. At one point in time, everybody needed a new iPhone. <laughs> will I buy one? Maybe, but... It's lost its shine. People need to go back to physical spaces and enjoy the act of buying stuff you like. And one of the things that people like to buy here is bubble tea. Oh, yeah. And I hear that you helped Brian a lot in just becoming an Endeavor entrepreneur. I wonder if you could share a bit about that whole process. Brian is a sterling founder. And not just from me, but from his families who actually said that at the end of it. And these were some of the guys from the US and everybody else. Brian wants to build a generational business. He's fully self-aware that he may not get to the vision of T-Life that he sees today in his lifetime. He is building it for his kids. Wonderful kids, by the way. Cook me a meal in, in, in Bali. 
And it's a matter of knowing that, at least in my mind and everybody else in Endeavor, him reaching significant success. He lives, what, thousands of dollars now in Asia? He still is hungry for that. He's always hungry to learn. He's never too arrogant to take anyone's feedback. He's humble enough to say, look, yeah, you're right. I didn't see that. He spends his weekends, his actual personal time speaking to entrepreneurs outside of Endeavor, before Endeavor. He, was, he would do it willingly. Whether you are a big founder, whether you're a person having an idea, you need to bounce an idea off of it, he will do it. An entrepreneur like him comes very rarely. Not in the ability to just execute, but the ability to have that merit and humbleness. He checks his ego out of the door. Every time you speak to him and say, man, you did a good job, man, you, you scaled this, he will be the first to say, I didn't do it alone. How many guys would actually go and say, I didn't do it alone? Very good. Because by the very nature of any business, you are the key man. And you're the key man because of the fact that you founded it, you're the CEO, you're, you know, whatever you may be. And the press and the world will brand you as that person. It is very hard for you not to drink that Kool-Aid and say, yes, I am this person, right? He's not that. And I think the fact that he's now scaling his business, his Philippines business is going really well. And a very unique business as well, because Philippines is more of a BPO, you know, Manila is. So it's more of late night. So people start spending more after 12 because, you know, they have shifts. I'm just supremely privileged to have Brian in the network because now other entrepreneurs will have a chance to speak and to learn how he made his business. I mean, look, he could have easily raised the white flag and say, I'm done when the whole chat time fiasco came up, but he didn't. He said, look, I'm going to hunker down and build this. Then he'll be the first to say again, you know, I come from a small town in Pernice. If I can do it, you all can do it too. And, and I think that's what people need to hear. But I guess hearing it from a stage or seeing a YouTube video of him, is it the same as sitting in the space with him because his energy is infectious? How would you say it keeps certain founders going and certain founders who just raise them at quite flat? Because you can never fail if you just keep going. I mean, as they say, you miss 100% of the shots you don't take, right? Yeah. Everybody goes through periods of despair, depression, intense sadness, especially because your business is never going to be like this all the time. Yeah. At best, it's like a heart attack waiting to come. Yeah. It's who they surround themselves with, it could be their co-founders, but more often than not, it is your support system, which is why I think when I saw Endeavor in 2018, I needed that because I needed people outside of my guys who would obviously drink the Kool-Aid with me. We have to, right? Because if we don't drink the Kool-Aid, the team will feel the despair. We have to put out a brave front, right? Which is why having that, that support center outside of your personal network. I had an entrepreneur recently that was trying to get financing from one of the biggest banks in KL, Malaysia. And for some reason, was having a problem with it. And during one of his mentorship sessions, we had one of the persons who happened to sit on the board of that bank. We, and she's not our mentor, she is our mentor now. For whatever reason, found out about it, helped it out, and you got it. It sounds simple because, oh yeah, because you're Endeavor, you, you know everybody and you get this done. But shouldn't everybody be giving that chance? I mean, even if you're not entrepreneurs, everyone's trying to build a legacy, right? You're not trying to leave a mark, leave a dent in the universe, right? And if it makes it just that little bit easier, why not? So what's your advice for people who are looking to build that community, but they don't even know where to start? Today, if you look at Malaysia, we have so many different parties involved in the ecosystem today that are all working towards a same singular vision, which is to build a better Malaysia. So Cradle has another separate company within called My Startup, which is doing exactly that. And they're doing it all over the country now. I was with them in Penang. They were in Kuching. They were they were in Sabah. They're going to states that usually get left behind mm. because everybody talks about Klangbin. So this is entrepreneur at a national scale. There are other accelerators and seed investors that have come up over the past few years. So Panjana, which is an MOF entity, is a sovereign fund that then invests into a few general farmers or VC firms that will then deploy capital different stages. That's for funding. In terms of a network of entrepreneurs with like-minded individuals, there's a huge Facebook group run by a guy a friend of mine, Daniel, yeah. Shout out to you, Dad. Yeah. And he's he's always there. Daniel is always there to roll up his sleeves. So if you're not getting the advice you need or the shoulder to cry on, I think first and foremost, check your ego at the door. Everybody's going through what you're going through in some way, shape or form, maybe in different variations. There's nothing to be ashamed of. Find the right crowd and let them guide you back to where you need to go. What about in terms of resources and gangs on getting started? There is so much out there. The problem is which to start off with? 
again, there's no one size fits all for this because if you're doing a traditional non-tech startup, there are many, many different resources for that. So if you're trying to do a tech startup and you're not a tech co-founder, then obviously you can obviously look at any of these message boards or there's also a, a I think a, a company that sort of matches you with uh, founders as well. Uh, but obviously they're very selective too, right? So I'm not saying that's the only option, but you should give it a try. And then there's obviously, as I mentioned earlier, the groups like Daniel's group. So there are many other startup groups in Malaysia. But I think we've come to the point that we are mature enough now that we have structured program to not sound like a broken record here. Obviously, Google first. Depends on what you want to know. If you're too lazy to Google, chat GPT, the hell out of it. They'll give you the answer you need, right? One layer, more lazy. You'll be surprised how many guys when I go up to them and say, man, you'd be a good founder. And they come up to me and say, yeah, but I don't have an idea. And here I'm thinking, to me at least, I have like a hundred ideas a week. And here's a person who I see has got the traits of a fantastic entrepreneur. What are those traits? Has grit, has the kind of ability to stand, to be able to find calm in winning the storm. And that makes a very good entrepreneur because when you found a company at the beginning, everything is against you. Market's against you. If your competitors, they're trying to kill you. Your investors are chasing you because you've got to show growth. You're struggling to hire people because you're not going to be able to pay premium. Let's say you, you know, your other guys are paying you today. How do you stay calm? The ability to, I guess, break down problems into solvable chunks, which it sounds easy, but most people don't do it. And I think my favorite is they're not problems to the solution, which a lot of people are, right? It sounds very, very straightforward, but the last one is this, and this, I'll, I'll quote a guy named Arif Nagmi, he ran, you know, he's, he's obviously a person who's completely, you know, polarizing because they either hate him or you, you love him. But regardless of what you think of, of, of Abraj, one of his most interesting statements was this, the only time work comes before success is in the dictionary. Which is true, man. Just going to put your back into it. You once quoted Mark Zuckerberg, always hire someone who you would work for in an alternate universe. I wonder who you would work for. I think I will work for any one of the people I've hired. I mean, in Endeavor, I will work with any of them. Maybe one of them know because she's a bit strict with me. <laughs> even, even though, yeah, she tells me what to do most of the time. Actually, most of them tell me what to do, really. So I'm already working for them, but I hire based on that. Because to me, it's more of, can I hang out with them and not talk about work for three days when we travel. And, and traveling is the one time you break the walls down because either you can't stand that person or you realize, hey, this, this person is someone I don't mind being friends with beyond you know, the four walls of this office. Like the airplane test and... Yeah, airplane test, right? Airplane test is okay because you can sleep. When you're stuck in a room in the middle of whatever it was, you know, it's, it's, it's going to be like insane because you know what happens with us, right? You will put on a version of yourself when you're out. Well, version of yourself when you're doing your, you know, pitching or sales run and then when you want to go home or when you're going home you just want to just unwind and just say you know screw everybody else i just want to decompress but when you're traveling with your colleagues you can't decompress except when you sleep right because your events go up to late nights and then your entertaining goes up to late nights you got to go and network and endeavor is a global network which means you got to be networking with everybody around the world and put on a good show right and then when you go back to sort of your show, Airbnb, where together, you, you're not going to just go in and just sleep. And you're traveling in the car together and this whole bunch of stuff. You realize, hey, you know, I don't mind working for them. Because you realize that, hey, they've got the same DNA. So I don't hire any of them. So what happens even in Endeavor today, I only sit at the point to interview the person last to say whether they are the right fit. Because to me, attitude trumps aptitude mm -hmm. any day. You can teach them the skills they need to do. But if they've got a shitty attitude, ain't no amount of teaching will change that. Right, so which is why I think I'll work for any of it. What kind of questions do you ask to find out about these attitudes? One of my favorite questions, which I, which I think stumps them, I haven't done that recently, is tell me something that's not on your CV, and then they really get confused. But usually that brings out the best out of them. And then the next question, and this is to be honest, not me. I took it from the guy who ran Sequoia. I forgot his name, the American guy. So the first question is tell me what's not on your CV, and the second one is what else. So what else is the best one? So you want to see how smart the person is, not just in terms of IQ, but in being on your feet. The average answer will be, what else is what else is on the scene? But the actual answer you're looking for is, what else is anything else is that? I'm going to turn it on you then. What's not on your CV? A lot. <laughs> what else? A lot of so. <laughs> yeah, because I, I don't really care about the CV. Because I hate it when people say, oh, why are you only at the job one year that you need? And just because a person needs a job, does it mean that the person's a bad worker? Yes, sometimes it could be, but more often than not, they might not just like the company. And, you know, you've got these millennials these days, they don't stay longer than two years anyway, right? And then they'll find something and they'll stay for five. It's the inverse, right? Back then, our parents' generation will stay for 10 years. 
And then maybe another thing in the last few years, one or two years, because of value, right? That's the thing I wanted to bring up before we wrap up. I noticed that you have left many, many different jobs. Yep. Almost easily. Like a lot of people struggle with even the idea of quitting love and quitting. You don't seem to do that. What's the mentality? I get bored really easily. Mm -hmm. I've got a very short attention span and because I read really quickly and I understand concepts really quickly. So the same thing happens at a job that I do. If I've done enough that I can do and I've made the impact that I can do, the question then comes as to, can I do more if I stay another three or four more years? And if the answer is yes, I'll stay. If I don't contribute enough or my position in that company isn't impactful enough for me to drive the needle forward, I will still. So it's always about what is the value I'm generating for myself? Obviously, you got to look for yourself first because you are your own person. And then what impact are you generating for the company for you to have left a mark big enough to say, shit, this guy did a great job. So if I do think I can do something, I'll stay for as long as I can. Or for as long as it'll have me. I stay there at the pleasure of either the board or in the case of West Spring, the president. What's next for you? Getting back on the saddle, I guess. Right now, in Endeavor, I think there's a lot more work we do because I think if you look at what we've done in the past couple of years, thanks to my team, we've been amazing. Win behind my selfie. Always make me look good. Everywhere I go, everyone say, oh, I see you on LinkedIn. I don't post any of that. No. Which is why I stopped no. posting. I stopped posting on LinkedIn myself for a year now. I have stopped posting on Pora because otherwise it looks like I'm just tuning my own horn. So I don't post it. My team does. Which is fair because it, it's not just about me. It's about the entrepreneur. I just happen to be in the photos, which I also don't want to be. But, but everyone knows about you. So for you, you're the conduit. Yes, I agree. But to me, I've always told the team, I always want the, 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 the entrepreneurs to shine because the entrepreneurs are the beacon that bring other entrepreneurs here. When they're here, then let us do what we can to help grow your business. So what's next for me is obviously, I want Malaysia to be the hub for investment as it was when we were raising. Back then, we were always making a joke. You threw a stone, you found someone who raised half a million dollars. Today, it's not you. Until that job is done, I still got a bit more to do to see, can Malaysia be centrifugal point because you can get good talent here. Cost of living is affordable. Infrastructure is good. You can travel within three hours anywhere, man. So why are we not in the center of South Korea? Why do you think that's the reason? I think because the government policies before this were a bit sort of wayward, right? So if you look at the current government, I think with Tesla coming in, it's a big deal, right? Because they removed that local equity involvement, which bodes well. Because then investors who say, look, I want to come in. I believe Malaysia is a good country, but I'm concerned about the ownership part of it. If we keep to this, it's going to be transformative to the point that I think our diaspora that left when they say we'll come back, like what we see in Greece. Ellen, thank you so much for your time here with me. I love to end all my interviews with the same question. So the first is this. Do you feel like you found your why? So what you didn't get from the interview is the fact that I went through a massive spiritual journey for the past three years, before the pandemic. Because I realized that there was more to life than just living through it, which is what I said at the very beginning in terms of a lot of people is born asleep goes to work asleep, marries asleep, dies asleep. Then I realized that very few people are actually awakened, not enlightened, because that's another level, and I'm not clearly that, but at least awakened enough to know that you have very many reasons why you're put on this planet and why you choose to take birth, not given birth. You take birth in this existence. To my why, at the very least, I've known now, because I've met quite a few sort of spiritual guides in the past, my why is not because I knew it, because I've heard it from four or five different people from different countries, really. My purpose on this, at the very least, planet, is to help people as well as I can. And I think it's ironic, because the first time I said it, it's like, what? I'm an assistant? And then the guy said, no, think of yourself as a doctor. No one goes to a doctor when they're healthy. But when they're sick, only doctors can help. And I realized that it brought a lot more sort of value to what I do right now. And that's why I actually really enjoy being in this space. I want to help as much as I can entrepreneurs because of the fact that I know the pain because when I was failing I had no lifeline no one literally gave their hand out I mean of course the guys in DG saved us no doubt but as I was sinking I had no, no lifeline what kind of legacy do you want to leave behind I want to leave a legacy from two sides personal and professional I think from a professional side a business that I guess to quote Brian that lasts generations because multi-generational businesses at least in Malaysia it's still few and far between. We've only got, at max, which I found out a couple of days ago during the event, I think three generations, which is still quite sizable, really. But that's also because the first generation started in the 1900s and so on. So to leave a multi-generational business behind, that's one of my sort of professional goals. I think a personal one would be to impart in some ways the clarity that you should look up once in a while in life to find more people to realize that if you don't, life just passes you by. To stop and literally breathe and experience rather than living life.
we're rushing from one moment to the next. And I think to be able to have that spiritual side, so the professional and the personal spiritual side, is to be able to share this. And my team will probably tell you this because we do our sessions off-site and we sort of go into this mode where everybody cries, is to find more people that can then multiply this. So multiply the professional side and multiply on the fact that we are enjoying an existence here together. Let's make it a little bit less painful for them. What do you think are the most important qualities of a successful person? Self-awareness, one. Second is not humbleness in the sense that I'm choosing to be humble, but inside they're not, but the actual true nature of being humble and that Malay saying that when the rice grows, the heavier it gets, the more it bows. Like you should realize that how many doors open to get you here. It isn't just you opening one door and you became someone. Everyone got you there. And to remember that you stood on the shoulders of giants to get you to where you are. That's number two. And number three, I guess, have that give back mentality. That's what makes you successful. The moment I'm successful, or even if they don't think they're successful yet, it's never too late to say, look, I want to take the time to then share my horror or war stories with someone that may find inspiration from me. Like what the Sakura Brothers guy told me, right? Salim. I will tell you what I think I did right in my business, but if you don't listen, that's your choice. But I will do what I can to impart my knowledge. And that's not free. That's his actual life bank of experiences. Say other biggest giants you stood on. I mean, Joel, Rafik, Chen Chao, these are guys who are with me still today, right? That's in Groupon for sure. My parents, obviously, and everyone who's a mentor, a board member in Endeavour, they're literally carrying me up, right? Without them, that wouldn't be Endeavour it is today, right? Because they believe in the vision that the team and I have set to grow how we select and support entrepreneurs here. And because they trust in the team completely, 100%, allowed us to get to where we are today, allow us to select the best entrepreneurs, and allow us to then support them to grow more. So these guys are clearly guys who have made me very appreciative and very privileged to be here. And where can people go to find out more about what you're doing, what Endeavor is doing? So what I'm doing, you can go to my Instagram. That's my name. Don't go to my Quora, like what Lin Ye did. That's embarrassing. I'll delete them all today. Bye-bye. Right? So my Instagram is my name. For Endeavor, we are on Instagram. We are on LinkedIn. And these are our most active platforms. If you are an entrepreneur that's looking to reach out, we will speak to anyone regardless of size because no entrepreneur is too small or too big. I sadly didn't find your blog. But <laughs> <laughs> that was off camera, you know. Very sad about, but is there one story on that blog that we didn't get to cover that you don't mind sharing? I sure. think I covered the failure of Paragon in there. And I think when I read it back, I could actually feel the pain of that failure as it was yesterday. That betrayal, you know. And I think if you read it, you'll read a younger version of me that felt like I was angry with the world and very little about me. Like, screw everybody else. You don't know what the hell I had to go through and the angst of not knowing what I did for you all. Today. I mean, that very selfish leader. So I was more of a boss and not a leader. And that was a telling sign. I felt the pain because I remember that. Okay, I remember that pain that was writing then, smashing the keyboard. And then I realized today, because I think I read that during the time that we did our offsite with the team and everybody was crying. She was literally crying buckets, by the way. And I'm pointing the lady on the right here. You can't see her because camera's pointing at us. Lucky, you know, for her. To the point that we were crying because we were, at the very least point in time, very at peace with all of us. It's a completely 180 degree company. To the ones that were crying because they were squeezed and everybody didn't like the way that they were worked there, to actually enjoying what they do. Yeah. You're not going to share the link, are you? Nope. <laughs> Otherwise, they're going to share it with everybody. <laughs>